Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to, to be here. Um, as Nima mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, indirect detection in, um, in my lecture today. So this will not be, as said, on the schedule about dark matter at the LHC, though I'm also very happy to discuss that. So um, grab me afterwards or at any point if you want to chat more about that. Um, so my thinking was that in the hour and a half that we have, what I want to be able to do is um, motivate for you how we kind of set up problems when we ask, um, how do we search for dark matter in the sky? Um, so both on the, the theory side, but also give you some of the nuts and bolts about what needs to be done when you actually sit down with the data set uh, to do an analysis. Um, and I'm hoping that between those two things, so that's two, one through three above, um, it's a bit of a toolkit so that if you were to sit down with any paper that's published on uh, um, a search for dark matter annihilation in gamma ray data, you'd be able to kind of understand roughly what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and then in the last part of our time together, I'll show you some of the uh, recent analyses that have been done at Fermi just to kind of give you a sense for what the status of the field is, is today. Um, I should also say that um, I'd like to keep this as informal as possible, so please feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point with any questions. I'd rather be taking questions kind of in the middle rather than, than all at the end, so please don't hesitate at all to, to ask questions. Uh, okay, so for the first part, can everybody see if I write in the middle board here? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Um, so to start off with, I want to motivate, essentially just build up where we expect the dark matter to be in the galaxy, um, essentially what its distribution is, the size it is, um, and mainly I want to do this um, because when we are going out and looking for dark matter signals, we need to know where to look. Um, and so the way I like to always break this down is to start off from um, the best, one of the best uh, pieces of evidence that we have for dark matter, uh, the rotation curve. And so what we're going to do is start off with the rotation curve as, um, as the basic and essentially build up from there to describe uh, what the distribution of dark matter is in the Milky Way or, or really any galaxy. So what is a rotation curve? Um, many of you have probably already seen this, but um, as a review, what you're looking for here is um, the, the circular velocity uh, in a galaxy as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. Um, and through a series of spectacular measurements in the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, we have these series of uh, rotation curves for a variety of different systems, and all tend to show this kind of generic feature where the curve flattens out. Um, it's worth emphasizing just how spectacular these measurements are. Um, people first started doing these in the 1930s and 40s, so essentially after Fritz Wicke's first mention of dark matter, and it really took decades before the measurements, which are fundamentally extremely challenging, to, it just took decades before they were good enough that people trusted the results. Um, and so the, the real kind of um, clincher paper on these, on rotation curves, came out in the early 1980s. Um, Vera Rubin was, um, played a big role in, in that. Um, so like I said, in many of the systems where people measure this, they observe that the circular velocity flattens out. Um, this is surprising because in Newtonian gravity, we expect something different. So we expect that the circular velocity should go as 1 over square root of r, right? So that would mean that this should have fallen off um, with distance rather than flattened out. So um, there's you know, two ways that uh, people have tried explaining this. One is with modifications to Newtonian gravity. Um, I'm not going to focus on that today because that carries the additional challenge of not being able to explain the cosmic microwave background. Um, what I will focus on is the particle dark matter interpretation, which is to say, well, maybe there's a lot more mass in these systems than um, were otherwise 
than we can actually see. Um, and so we posit that there's some additional dark matter in addition to the baryonic matter. So if we run with that assumption, then we can start actually making some statements about what the distribution of dark matter um, should be, given the fact that the rotation curve flattens out. So um, if we want the circular velocity to be constant, that means that the mass has to scale with radius. Um, at these large distances. And if we were to then take, look at uh, the, um, the mass density, then that's just m over r over r cubed. So we get that the mass density goes as 1 over r squared. Um, there's an implicit assumption that I've made in this. Um, I don't know if you caught it while I was making it, but um, I have assumed at this point here, when I write down this density distribution, that the dark matter is distributed um, spherically uh, and isotropically. Um, so if I were to sketch this out, I've made the assumption that my dark matter forms this diffuse uh, halo that's extended, and that's in, in sharp contrast to the dark matter disk. Uh, which is just uh, flat, right, just a plane. Um, the reason I can make that assumption is because I say, well, um, baryons interact with each other, they dissipate energy, so that makes them collapse to form a disk, whereas I'm making the assumption that the dark matter is um, not interacting strongly with itself, and so as a result, it does not lose energy through frictional forces, and so it does not collapse to form a disk like the baryons, and instead, um, remains in this extended halo-like system. So um, if I combine those assumptions then, the fact that the, the dark matter halo doesn't collapse on itself with the flatness of the rotation curves, I would estimate that the density of the halo goes as uh, 1 over r squared. Um, I should add the caveat that uh, there's a lot of really interesting models uh, that people have been writing down and considering recently where the dark matter does actually interact with itself some small amount. Um, and in these scenarios, you can actually get the dark, a small subcomponent of the dark matter to collapse and form um, something like the baryonic disk. Um, I, won't, I won't talk too much about those scenarios now, but I thought I would just mention it because they're, they're quite interesting. All right. <laughs> okay. This is like a very large blackboard. <laughs> All right. Um, good. So uh, once we start off with uh, that assumption about the density distribution for the halo, we can do some estimates to see how just how large uh, the halo of the Milky Way should be. So how extended is that halo relative to the, the disk? Um, and so in order to... Uh, to do that, we need to use um, a few pieces of information that we have from observation. And so the first is that um, we we have a measurement of the uh, mass of the dark matter halo for the Milky Way. Um, that's coming from um, stellar kinematics, um, and that is roughly 10 to the 12 solar masses. So this symbol here, capital M with this little subscript O dot, uh, means uh, masses of the sun. Um, the other piece of information that we need is that the local dark matter density, so this meaning, by local I mean the dark matter density um, in the region around the sun, so this is roughly 0.3. Um, big caveats on both of these numbers, there's a lot of uncertainties on this, um, but for our purposes, we'll just take these as rough, um, rough estimates for their, their true values. Um, so if we take these two things, then we can solve for the size, the rough extent of the, um, the Milky Way halo by saying that... Um, by just integrating rho of r. And if I put in here 
r1 over r squared and solve this, um, what I get is that the extent of the halo is approximately 100 kiloparsecs. <clears throat> so for context, the radius of the galactic disk in the Milky Way is about 10 kiloparsecs. So you can get a sense for the scale here that the, um, the dark matter halo is way more massive, way more extended than um, the galactic disk. Indeed, it seems to extend out almost a factor of 10 farther than, uh, than the visible matter in the, in the disk. So that's, um, it's just, it's enormous. Yes? Oh, good. Um, yeah, so the, the local density um, comes from measurements of the vertical velocities of stars in, um, in the region around the sun. So um, if this is the galactic plane and the sun is here, um, what people do is they look at stars in the plane and measure their velocity in and out of the plane. Um, and so that velocity is going to depend on um, the, the amount of dark matter that's, in, uh, that's nearby the sun. Now, this is actually, now this is tangential, but I think very interesting. Um, this is the number that's mostly quoted. There's about a factor of two uncertainty on this. Um, however, all of these are essentially derived in the same way, where you're looking for the vertical velocity for these stars. Um, all of this... Uh, makes the assumption that uh, the system is in equilibrium. Um, and we actually don't know that for sure. Um, indeed, the, the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud are in the process of merging with our galaxy, um, and they're, they're starting to get pretty close. And their tidal effects are already causing ripples in the galactic disk. Um, and those ripples break the assumption of equilibrium. Um, and so uh, I, I think there's a lot more uncertainty on this value than what's actually uh, typically quoted because the factor of two uncertainties that you usually see are coming from just um, from all calculations that are assuming equilibrium, but we don't even know for sure that that's, that that's actually the case. Yes? The, oh, the local baryonic density in these units? Actually, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Locally? Probably, I think so. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, say a number that it turns out to be wrong, because, I mean, it, it would probably depend a lot on what's going on specifically in the neighborhood of the sun, and I'm not entirely certain, so I don't want to, like, uh, quote a number that I think would be right on average, but it actually might be incorrect locally. So, for example, one thing that, like, we don't really know for sure, especially given this issue here, is whether or not we happen to live in a void. Because um, it could be that, like, you know, the dark, we, there's this ginormous dark matter halo surrounding our galaxy, but that really in the location of the sun, um, the, the average dark matter density might be smaller than what we might expect. And so based on these studies where people look at the vertical velocity of the stars, we don't think that's the case because we get values that look like this. But if this equilibrium assumption breaks down, then, um, then we actually just don't know. Yeah? yeah? Well, so direct detection constraints are usually quoted as a function. So it's usually quoted like cross-section times local density. So everything would kind of scale. But it could be that if we, you know, if this breaks down um, and um, this is much less than what we'd expect it to be, it could be that there's no reason we should expect direct detection experiments to be seeing anything. At all. Yeah. That, right? Yeah. I mean, if we happen to be living in a local void, there's no dark matter flying through the Earth. And so we should never expect to be able to detect it directly. And is there like some Well, yeah, I, well, I think people are, are doing these, these simulations now with the LMC and SMC, looking at their mergers and trying to understand precisely what is going on in terms of how they're perturbing the disk. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think this is all just, you know, it's knowledge base that's building up now as these simulations are becoming more, 
more detailed. But yeah, I mean, I think that's a fundamental question that we're going to need to need to understand in order to know for certain whether or not this is accurate. It just accurately describe what's going on near the sun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, so it, well, so if, when you look at these over like a variety of systems, like each different galaxy kind of has slightly different behavior in their rotation curve, but on average, you see that it kind of roughly flattens out. Um, I mean, I drew it in a rather dramatic way, so not all systems have it be exactly flat. Um, the other thing, too, is most of these go out, I didn't write the scale in radius, but most of these will go out something like 20, 25 kiloparsecs. Um, and so uh, at some point, it can't continue being flat, because like, then that would actually end up meaning that you have some infinitely massive halo. Um, so at some point, it, it does need to change, even if it is a dark matter halo that's causing that, that dynamics. Yeah. Um, OK. So. Right, good. So, so we've seen now that uh, the general size of this halo is um, huge in comparison to the size of the disk. And the last thing I wanted to just estimate for you was the average velocity of the stars in the halo. Um, and if we assume that the dark matter halo is in equilibrium, um, then this is given by the virial theorem. And so it is roughly just uh, square root g mass of the halo divided by radius of the halo, <clears throat> which is just about 200 kilometers a second. So the key here, and this is going to come into play in some of the things we're going to discuss later, is that on average we expect that the dark matter in the halo is non-relativistic. Um, and that leads to some interesting phenomenology. Um, there are certain signatures that would arise specifically because the dark matter is moving um, fairly slowly. Uh, okay. Now, I, I did these estimates in this way just because I think they're pretty illustrative and they give you a sense of the scales that we're talking about here, um, both the size scale of the halo and also the speed. Um, but like I already mentioned, there's a lot of assumptions that have gone into this. So, um, Uh, that's that. Well, that's average over the whole thing. Yeah. So if I have like a gas okay. that's extend that your know, gas with mass this and extension that, this is what you would expect to get if it's in equilibrium. Right. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so just to kind of be very clear about the set of assumptions that have gone into here, um, the primary one is that the Milky Way halo is in a steady state. And so what I mean here is that it's not actually changing a lot. It's, it's in equilibrium. Nothing's really perturbed it for a really long time. And it turns out that that's not a terrible approximation to make about our galaxy, because um, the Milky Way tends, is, um, is considered a fairly quiescent galaxy, um, which is just one way of saying that it hasn't had any major mergers with another galaxy in a really long time. So its last major merger was roughly 10 giga years ago. And by major merger, I mean a galaxy that comes in, hits the Milky Way, and it's so massive that it completely perturbs the disk and just kind of messes everything up. Um, and so if we had one of these large mergers happen very recently, uh, we probably wouldn't be here um, talking about it. Um, and uh, it, I mean, just it would have really kind of messed everything up. So the fact that the major merger happened a long time ago um, means that you know, the steady state approximation is probably OK. However, we know that it's not exact, mainly because we, we know for certain that minor mergers are continuing to happen. So 
we can actually see um, galaxies that are in the process of merging with our own. Um, Sagittarius is one really nice example because we can actually see the orbital path that it's taking as it's falling in um, to the Milky Way because it leaves behind like a bunch of tidal debris as it's falling in. So um, we we're, we're actually see, it's like a photographic snapshot of this thing as it's getting eaten up by the Milky Way. So we know that these smaller galaxies are continuing to merge with ours. And so when they do, they, they perturb the system in a small way, but they do change things like the phase space. Uh, for the dark matter distribution. And so the only way of really being able to get a good estimate of you know, many of the quantities I wrote above is to do a full um, n-body simulation, which actually um, follows the uh, gravitational interactions between many different systems in the process of forming um, a galaxy that's about the same size as the Milky Way. Um, and so I want to just show um, a movie of one of these simulations just so that you kind of get a sense uh, for, for what this looks like. Um, um, so this movie is, uh, is from a, an M-body simulate, one of the highest resolution N-body simulations. Um, it's called Via Lactea. I guess I'll wait until this thing moves down since it's kind of loud. Um, so what the movie is going to show is um, the dark matter structure in, in the, um, the Via Lactea halo, uh, starting at redshifts of about 12 um, and uh, moving towards uh, today. Um, and so the color here tells you where the dark matter is densest, so the brighter the, um, the color, so the more whitish it is, it, it's indicating um, a higher density of, of dark matter. There it goes. Um, so you can see very clearly that the dark matter is forming a lot of little clumps. Um, and some of the clumps are actually aligned along these filaments. Um, but they're all kind of getting driven in and, and merging um, towards the central point. So you can see a lot of these clumps kind of coming in and swinging around and then um, uh, kind of orbiting around until they get completely disrupted. Um, and as these clumps are getting disrupted, um, they're like the dark matter that they shed just becomes part of uh, the Milky Way uh, as a whole. And so at the end of the day, the halo that Via Lactea sees, um, this is like if we had dark matter, special dark matter glasses, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, and there's two aspects of this that are quite remarkable. One is uh, um, all of the incredible amount of structure that you see there. So um, you know, there's a lot of these very bright clumps that are just kind of floating around there um, amongst this kind of background distribution of, of dark matter that's, that's visible. Um, and we get a lot of information from simulations like this. So we can uh, recover, for example, the, um, the dark matter density profiles that we get out of simulations that track all of these gravitational interactions between um, these dark matter particles. Yeah, sorry. Oh, the bright spots are uh, subhalos, so they're like clumps of dark matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the bright spots here are clumps of dark matter, so you see that some are kind of bigger than others, and it's just because there's like a distribution of sizes that you expect. The big clump in the middle is just the center of the galaxy, so the center of the galaxy is really bright. Um, and, uh, and then that falls off, but you still end up getting these bright spots that are kind of orbiting and merging with, with the galaxy. Yeah? Good, yeah. So Via Lactea is a pure dark matter simulation, so there's no baryons, um, there's no gas, no stars. Um, and so for a while, the best, the highest resolution simulations that we had were coming from these dark matter only runs. Um, but recently, over the last few years, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in simulations that have also been including baryons. So um, these are full hydrodynamic simulations. They are very computationally intensive. These are the kinds of things you'd be running on supercomputers. Um, and it's really remarkable, actually, how quickly the field has kind of 
um, grown in the last few years as many more of these simulations have been run. And um, we've been learning a lot about, uh, there's some features that people had thought were just generic based on these dark matter only simulations, which we're now finding you know, can be kind of mocked up when you include uh, baryons. So I'll talk a little bit about those in a second. Uh, yeah, so all of these simulations make the assumption, I mean, essentially it's a cold dark matter picture, so um, they're assuming that the dark matter is collisionless. Um, and when they do think, when, so when I say things like they model the dark matter, um, they're not actually modeling individual dark matter particles, because that's not possible to actually simulate. What they, you know, a particle in a simulation is something like a 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar mass clump. So that's kind of like the, the smallest clump of dark matter that they start with, and then they, they, tra they trace it as it uh, evolves as a function of time. Yeah? Uh, just a question about the initial conditions. Mm -hmm. Do they know how to set them? Oh, yeah. So they usually set the initial conditions according to like WMAP or, or Planck cosmology. I don't remember specifically if, I think Vialatea was probably using WMAP, but they, they set it uh, according to that, and then they watch it evolve. So usually what they do is they end up, as the thing starts evolving, they find a halo that's forming that looks like it's going to be really similar to a Milky Way halo. So they want to eventually find a halo that's roughly the same size, mass, as the Milky Way halo, um, and one that's in a fairly quiet region of, of space. Because we know that, like I said, the Milky Way is fairly quiet. Um, it only has two large satellites, and there isn't any kind of, there isn't a ton of activity going on around it, so you want to pick a halo in your simulation that's kind of isolated and mimics these conditions so that the conclusions that you're making are as similar as possible to a Milky Way hay, uh, type sy system. Um, okay, I think we're ready to go up now. Okay. Um, okay, so, so some of the things we've learned from these simulations is that the dark matter distribution um, looks like it's fairly universal from simulation to simulation um, and appears to to follow um, what's called the Navarro Frank White profile or NFW profile. So Um, this is essentially just a double, double falling power law, um, where R s is a scale radius that's typically 20 kiloparsec. <clears throat> so uh, one thing that you can see is that in the limit where R is on the order or greater than R s, the Navarro Frank White profile goes as 1 over r squared, which is just what we got using our very simple estimate up above. Um, however, uh, what these simulations find is that as you go closer to the center of the galaxy, the, the halo appears to be cuspier than you might otherwise expect. Um, with these new simulations now that also include baryons, um, this is kind of, there's a lot of uncertainty on this. Primarily because people are finding that when you include things like supernova explosions and black holes that eject stuff in the middle of galaxies, um, you tend to form cores. Um, so instead of the dark matter density um, peaking as you go closer to, to the center of the galaxy, it looks like it can kind of core like that. Um, and there may be some evidence from dwarf galaxies for these kinds of cores to form. So that's something that's kind of up in the air now and uh, is, uh, you know, will hopefully get resolved as the, the measurements on these systems um, improve. Uh, the other thing um, I wanted to just mention, which we already saw in the picture, is that, um, you know, when I write down something like a density profile like this, that's just assuming that there's some overall smooth background component. But what we see in these simulations is that there's actually a lot of structure and there's a lot of these really bright clumps that are floating around. Um, and so each of those bright clumps can provide an opportunity for uh, searching for dark matter. Uh, the, uh, the RS? R RS um, uh, no, it'll it'll depend on the it'll depend on the system. So um, it's the RS is uh, very roughly 
it's going to be the radius where you expect to get one over R squared, so where the density distribution is isothermal. Um, and so that, that can vary a bit from system to system. Yeah. This is Milky Way, yeah. Oh, what I meant was the case where um, this term here is dominating over this term. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, did I copy that down wrong? Um, oh, uh, yeah, sorry. No, thank you. I was being a bit sloppy with my words. What I meant was, um, um, let me draw it out. That way I'm very explicit about it. Thank you. Okay. All right, so NFW is a doubly falling power law. When I go close to the center of the galaxy, I f go as one over R. When I'm very far from the center of the galaxy, I go as one over R cubed. And when I'm kind of here-ish, which is all kind of tilde level, but around RS, I'm transitioning from one over R to one over R cubed, and so it's closer to one over R squared. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, good, so that was kind of the broad strokes introduction I wanted to give on how we map out where we expect the dark matter is in our Milky Way. Um, what I want to do now is move on to uh, how we can use this information to make predictions for signals of dark matter annihilation. But before I do that, maybe I should just ask if there's any more lingering questions on this before we kind of turn the page a bit. Yeah? It seems like you're differentiating steady state and in equilibrium. Are those two different things or are they really the same thing? Ooh. Um, so I've been using it as if they're both roughly the same thing. So that once a system is in steady state, it's not being perturbed, and so it's had enough time to come into equilibrium. Um, I guess presumably, mm, I mean, maybe somebody can, might be able to say the system is in steady state in the sense that it hasn't gotten hit recently, it hasn't gotten hit now, but it, um, not in equilibrium because the system hasn't had a chance to fully recover from a hit that happened not too long ago. Um, yeah, I mean, when, so when I use it, I'm using it kind of interchangeably. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Is this just a, is it, is it a flat there? Is that rotating R or something? Like oh, yeah, that's because, um, right, it's on log log. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always log log in my head because that's the way it always shows up in my Mathematica plot. And then I draw it on the blackboard and it, Fine. yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah? Oh, oh, you mean how it gets cut off when you go, like if you send R out to infinity or something? Um, I don't know if there's anything <laughs> uh, deep I can say about that. I mean, this, you get the same problem there with one over R squared. It's not regulated. Um, so there's nothing deep about NFW profile. This is like, oh, we've run a ton of these simulations and we find that this, this particular fit does a, fairly good job at, at modeling all of them. It's actually kind of remarkable that it is pretty universal. Um, but um, nobody's actually really been able to derive that from first principles. Um, and uh, nobody really also takes this and integrates it out to infinity because usually you're using it to model something that's happening closer to the center of the galaxy. So the kinds of things that people typically worry about is precisely what's happening um, here uh, more often than what's going on uh, at at extraordinarily large R's. Okay, cool. So if there's no more questions, then I'm gonna move on to talking about how we actually model um, signatures of dark matter when it's annihilating in the galaxy. Jeez, <laughs> Woo. this is like, upper body workout. Okay. <laughs> um. 
So from what we've seen so far, uh, we can conclude that the dark matter is going to be densest in the center part of a galaxy. And so if what we're looking for is dark matter particles that are interacting with each other, where we'd want to look is precisely there because we'd just be increasing the probability of finding two dark matter particles that find each other um, and interact with each other. Um, and so, Um, so the kinds of things we're going to be interested in here is the scenarios where we have two dark matter particles that come in via some process that I will remain fairly agnostic about um, and then annihilate two uh, states um, that I'll label as being just standard model states. Um, and so what I'm going to do first is just uh, calculate what, derive what the um, annihilation rate would be for this kind of uh, scenario. Um, so the first thing we want is the annihilation rate per particle. And this is going to depend on the cross-section for this process happening. Um, and I'm going to write this out as a velocity averaged cross-section where this I here um, is going to denote um, the particular annihilation channel. So it can be, for example, that the dark matter can annihilate to a variety of different standard model states, and so each one of those channels would be um, labeled by a different value of I. <clears throat> so, so if we take this as being the cross-section for this process, then the annihilation rate per particle is going to be the density um, of the particle of the dark matter divided by its mass. So this is just another way of writing down the number density. And I multiply the number density times sigma i v and sum this over all the different annihilation channels. <clears throat> now, I tried to write this out um, very clearly here, so um, let me just kind of draw out schematically what's going on. So in the case, for example, where we're interested in annihilation at the center of our galaxy, um, the, the geometry of this is as follows. Um, we're here at the sun. This is the center of the galaxy. And let's assume that there's some annihilation event happening here. Um, what's going into this is we want to know the dark matter density here, a distance r from the center of the galaxy. Um, and that r is actually going to be a function of the line of sight distance l, which is the distance from the sun to the actual annihilation event, um, and uh, this angle psi that's in, in here. So um, we can write out r as a function of line of sight distance and angle psi, um, and then figure out what the density of the dark matter is at that, at that point. Um, good, so this is just using the sort of standard uh, rate formula. Um, and uh, we're nearly there, except for the fact that what we need to do now is to get the total annihilation rate we need to multiply this by the total number of particles that are there. <clears throat> so we want to know the total number of particles that are in some volume dv um, L squared dL d omega. So this is essentially some small volume around the star that I've drawn up there. Um, and uh, the, this uh, gives us um, the, the following. So exactly what we had from before, which is the annihilation rate per particle. multiply 
multiply this by the total number of particles in this volume. So that's going to be density divided by mass. That's the number density um, times the volume, dV. And we divide this by a factor of two um, because we're considering, um, you know, you need two particles for every annihilation event. I'm sorry? Hold on, hold on. Oh, you got it. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. So, so now we've taken annihilation rate per particle, multiplied it by the total number of particles, dark matter particles in the volume that can annihilate with each other. Um, and the last step is. Uh, so this is annihilation, this is total annihilation rate. And the last thing we need is the gamma ray flux, because we're going to assume that the dark matter annihilates into some standard model states. Those standard model states will produce photons, and those photons is what we actually observe. So in terms of the thing that's actually detectable, we need to convert this into um, a flux of photons. Um, and so to get the photon flux, we need to um, have, uh, so to get the photon flux, we need to know the number of photons that um, are produced in a, by a given standard model final state. So we need the following, so the number of photons in a given energy range um, E gamma. <clears throat> and so with this, we can now get our final answer, which is that the um, photon flux here is going to be um, we integrate over the angle and also the line of sight distance. Um, we now include uh, what we got here, right? So these factors of rho and sigma. So we have a rho squared um, and then a sum over all of our annihilation channels with these factors of cross section, mass, and um, the number of photons we get out from each of these annihilation channels. <clears throat> Um, so this is the final, uh, final answer, and if you were to pick up any paper that had to deal with, uh, you know, indirect detection, that's always just kind of quoted as fact, but now you've kind of seen how, where it comes from. Um, this uh, flux, so this is a gamma ray flux as a function of energy, um, uh, depends on uh, both astrophysical assumptions and particle physics assumptions. So the astrophysical assumptions come in here through the modeling of the dark matter density, and the particle physics assumptions come in here um, through uh, our assumption about what the cross-section is for the annihilation and the photons that we expect to get from each of the different annihilation events. Um, so let me first give you a sense for what these numbers look like for the case uh, for the uh, astrophysical part of this. Okay. You dropped a couple L squares in there, right? Oh, good, yeah. Um, so that L squared, I'm going to do this here. Um, it's coming from the fact that when we multiply by d n i d e gamma, we divide by um, 1 over 4 pi L squared. I kind of went through that quickly, but you multiply by this factor here. Um, so that cancels out the L squared that's hanging out there, and that's where the 4 pi comes from there.
Sorry? Oh, thank you. Yeah, there is. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Did I get them all? Um, what else do I my uh... Okay, I think that's I think that's everything. Okay. Perfect. So, um, yeah. So the the astrophysical um, part of this uh, is usually summarized in what's called a J factor. Um, which is just the part that's the integral over the, um, the density squared. So this is, just to be very explicit, uh, this term here. And this J factor depends on which system you're looking at. So just to kind of give you a sense for the size scales, um, if we're looking at a dwarf galaxy, which is like a small galaxy that's bound um, in the local group, um, bound to the, the Milky Way, uh, these typically have J factors that are roughly on the order of 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20. So these are dwarfs. Um, and I, I think these numbers are making the assumption that the dark matter density is uh, NFW distributed. Um, if we look at the largest satellite of the Milky Way, which is Andromeda, then the J factor is 10 to the 20. I'm sorry? Delta omega. Oh, good. Uh, so delta omega is uh, the angular volume around the place where you're... Uh, uh, you're integrating over. So like the patch on the sky where you have, let's say, your dwarf galaxy or something like that. <clears throat> um, so this is Andromeda. And if we look, um, the J factor for our own galaxy, so the center part of the Milky Way, is essentially is way larger than any of these other ones, 22 to 25. Um, PV per center squared, which is within um, 0 0.1 degree of the center of the Milky Way. <clears throat> so if somebody were to ask you, you know, where should I look to maximize my uh, probability of seeing a dark matter signal, you would, you know, look at these list of J factors and say, oh, well, clearly you're going to get the greatest enhancement if you look at the center of our own galaxy, because that's where the density is the highest by far. Um, and that would be correct if we lived in a perfect world where we didn't have to worry about things like backgrounds and uh, regular sort of astronomical kinds of sources of gamma rays. Um, so typically what happens when you're trying to find like the best systems to look for dark matter annihilation, you have to weigh both the um, J factor that you get with just how clean the system is. So as it turns out, the Milky Way, our own galaxy, is one of the brightest spots of dark matter but it's really messy. So there's a black hole that's there. There's a lot of gas. We expect to get a lot of gamma rays just from cosmic rays um, being ejected by all of these different sources. And dwarf galaxy, even though their J factor is several orders of magnitude weaker, um, end up being much cleaner systems because they're dark matter dominated and they don't have a lot of gas. Um, so when actually implementing a lot of this, um, you can't just look at the J factor. You have to also take into account um, the system itself that you're analyzing and how much contamination from standard sources you expect to get for these systems. Um, okay. Yeah? Um, so for this estimate, um, I think that's what I used to get these. I got these numbers a little while ago. Um, but that's actually up for debate. So there's some studies now that have been looking at um, the, the motions of, of whatever few stars we can actually see inside a dwarf galaxy to see if the, the, the density profile is cord um, or cuspy, where cuspy would be more NFW-like. And the results are kind of mixed and a little bit confusing. So some studies do find that there's evidence for cores in these dwarfs, but the error bars are still quite large. So we don't know definitively whether or not all of these systems have cores um, or some fraction of them have cores and the rest are cuspy. It's, it's a matter of... of a lot of debate right now whether or not we expect cord versus cuspy. 
Um, and even if a dwarf galaxy is, let's say, cored, it doesn't necessarily mean that our galaxy would be cored, because when you have systems on different scales, there's different processes and different feedback mechanisms in the center part, um, and so uh, that could just change um, what you would expect to get. And the tail shape also is called that. that uh, what do you mean, the tail shape? Well, uh, yeah, but so usually you're not, um, uh, when you make, when you do a calculation for, let's say, the dark matter flux, you're dominated by far with what's going, by, by what's going on really close to the center, and you're really not that sensitive to the assumptions of what's going on far away. So you could probably redo, I've never done this myself, but you could probably just redo this calculation changing, like, the outer slope of NFW, and I bet you're, you wouldn't get a different you just wouldn't really be too sensitive. There isn't enough dark matter there to really make a difference. Um, it's really whatever's going on in the core. Uh, in the center part of the galaxy. Um, okay. Um, good. So this is the astrophysical part that's feeding in there. And then, of course, there's also the particle physics part, which um, has to do with the, uh, that factor of DND, DNDE gamma, which is the number of photons that you expect to get um, from the showering of the standard model states, and then also the cross-section, the annihilation cross-section. Um, I will just kind of model some of these things out schematically so you kind of have an idea of what this looks like. Um, but let's first consider the case where I have a dark matter, two dark matter partic particles that annihilate um, to give me one photon and some other thing, where that other thing can be a photon, a Z boson, a Higgs, or some other neutral state in your favorite BSM um, scenario. Um, and if I just work out the kinematics for this, uh, I find that the energy of the photon that's coming out is <clears throat> is just the, the mass of the dark matter um, times this factor here, 1 minus mass of the other particle coming out squared over dark matter mass. So in the case where I have dark matter going to gamma gamma, then uh, we get this nice case where the energy of the gamma rays is essentially just the mass of the dark matter. So it's a monochromatic signal. Um, in the scenario where I have, for example, dark matter goes to Z gamma, it's also monochromatic, but the, the location of the line shifts a little bit lower. If I draw here, can everybody see that? Yeah, I'll make it big, but... So if I want to make a plot of um, the x-axis here is energy of the photon divided by the mass of the dark matter, and what I'm going to plot here on the y-axis um, is x squared dm dx. Um, if I have a final state that's gamma gamma, then I expect this to give me a delta function peak um, at uh, when the gamma rays have the same energy as the dark matter mass. So um, I just get a um, beautiful little peak located right at 1. If um, the dark matter goes to z gamma, then I'll get a peak that's shifted to slightly lower energy but it's still a delta function peak. Um, and so what's actually pretty cool is if you had a scenario like this, you could actually do something like spectroscopy because you end up getting these peaks in your data, um, and you can do things like figure out, um, you know, the relative branching fraction of going to gamma z versus gamma gamma because you see all these little peaks. Um, that's if we lived in a, in a very beautiful, wonderful world where things just were easy like that. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, other scenario that's a bit more complicated is the case where the dark matter annihilates to um, other states like, uh, let's say, quarks. We'll do um, BB bar. Um, so 
right? You know, where do the photons come from in this case? Well, these B quarks are produced, you know, somewhere in the universe or in the galaxy, let's say, um, and then as they're traveling around, um, they're going to start showering because they interact very strongly. So you're going to get uh, bound states, um, and in particular, you're going to get uh, pions, and um, those pions will decay. And in the decay of the pions, you get your photons. So you still get photons that you can look for, but they're just kind of coming from um, uh, a much longer process um, in, in, in by which they're being produced. So in this case, um, you actually need to model the showering of these states in order to get, um, in order to find out how many photons you get per BB bar event. Um, and it turns out you can do this um, with Pythia. So actually, that's my one statement that's closely related to the LHC. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can model this with Pythia, and it translates over directly to um, the scenario here. Um, and if you are actually um, interested in trying to implement this, um, I recommend there's a lot of tools available already online where people have done this. And there's one thing called the Particle Physicist Cookbook, where they've actually um, figured out um, all of these values of dm, d, e, gamma, um, and have these in a, some mathematica notebook that you can just use, so it's very convenient. Um, <clears throat> but in general, what's ha gonna happen in the showering process is that it's gonna smear out the energy of the photons in the final state, so you won't have these beautiful little peaks anymore. Instead, uh, you'll have something that looks more like this, like a broad um, gamma ray uh, excess, um, and so, it turns out that for um, quarks, and also if you look at gauge boson final states, uh, the distribution looks really similar between all of them. Um, the reason for that is because Ws and Zs just give you quarks. Um, and so uh, at the end, it just looks like as if you had just produced quarks. Um, and I, if you were to look at leptons, this tends to be a bit flatter and a bit broader. <clears throat> so um, I drew this here just so that you kind of get a sense for, depending on your, your model of choice and the um, annihilation um, states for the dark matter, the actual observable signal that you'd get can vary a lot. Um, nominally, these peaks should be easier to see than if you went to quarks, um, but um, in many different scenarios, many different models, these processes tend to be loop suppressed, and so they're much rarer than these ones. So typically, the flux is much larger for final states that, let's say, are going to, to quarks. Um, so uh, you tend to get more of this. It tends to be a little harder to see because the energies of the photons are spread out. Yeah? Oh, um, good. Yeah, so it, the same thing is going to happen here that's going to happen there. So the Z is going to decay to quarks. Um, so I'm going to get quarks from this. The quarks are going to shower and give me pions. The pions will give me photons. Uh, I mean, it, it'll be a little bit more diffuse than this one, but it's still less so than than this. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you gain a lot from the fact that this one here isn't perturbed in some sense, it's still fairly clean. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, trying to figure out um, if I haven't, I think I do, all right. I think I have enough time to talk a little bit about um, uh, what happens if we start getting a little fancier with our particle physics models that we wanna um, model. Um, and uh, in particular, what happens in the case where we have something like Sommerfeld enhancement. Um, so I don't, I'm not gonna have time to really do this in a huge amount of detail, but I think I'll be able to set it up and kind of motivate it so that you, can, you have an idea of what happens for these kinds of models. Sorry? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so people used to say that um, if you were to see a gamma ray peak here, that it would be a smoking gun signal for, uh, for a dark matter event. 
Then about three or four years ago, people saw a gamma ray peak um, and got very excited because they were like, oh my god, there's a smoking gun signal, it has to be dark matter. And it looked very compelling when you looked at it by eye. Um, turns out uh, it wasn't dark matter. The significance of the peak ended up decreasing as a function of time. I don't think we really know exactly what it was. It probably was something like some systematic effect in the detector system. Um, and uh, so the long, yeah, that was a bit of a, a long-winded way of answering your question, which is that um, I don't think there's, there's no specific astrophysical system that you'd, where you'd expect to get these kinds of peaks, which is why people called it smoking gun. Um, however, as we've learned from previous experiences with this thing, it turns out that it's not quite a smoking gun as we might have wished it could be because you can have other things like detector effects that end up, you know, mimicking these kinds of signals. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's challenging either, it, it, it's always challenging. You always have to be very careful whenever you see something to, to understand whether or not it's a real signal or something that's faking it. But um, sort of at first glance, there isn't any obvious astrophysical signal that would give you these peaks. Um, are there any other questions on this before I kind of move on to Sommerfeld? Enhancement? No? Okay. Um, okay, so I thought it would be fun to kind of just show you a little bit about what happens in scenarios where um, you end up with more complicated um, annihilations for the dark matter. And by more complicated, what I mean is uh, where you get things like the dark matter can interact uh, with itself through through additional forces. Yeah? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Mu mu, like muons? Oh, neutrinos? Oh, uh, well, that you wouldn't see anything here. If you were only going to neutrinos, you'd want to be looking, I mean, you'd want to look at ice cube. So you can, like, affect even the stored energy. Oh, yeah, there's, there's a whole set of, um, there's a whole set of observables that you could potentially get if you're annihilating primarily to neutrinos. It, it depends on when, when that's happening. Um, if it's happening today, like ice cube or something like that could look for that. Um, yeah, you would not expect to get anything in gamma ray, though. Okay, so um, Sommerfeld enhancement is a neat example mainly because it's something that arises primarily from the fact that the dark matter is non-relativistic, so this is going back to what I told you in the beginning part of the lecture. So here's an example of interesting phenomenology that occurs precisely because the dark matter is moving around uh, slowly in, in the galaxy. Um, so the general picture is going to be as follows. We can consider the case where we have um, a hard annihilation event, which is similar to essentially everything I've been describing so far. So in this case, I have um, my two dark matter particles come in, interact, um, and give me my standard model final states. Um, and in a hard annihilation process, I'm assuming that this interaction is essentially localized to the origin where um, the interaction takes place. Um, and the probability of finding um, the particles at the origin, at the annihilation site, is just going to be proportional to the wave function for the... Um, for these dark matter particles. So I can describe these by some wave function psi naught, um, and then I have my annihilation event here, and the probability of finding these, um, probability of finding the dark matter particles here is just going to be um, psi naught squared. Um, in contrast, if I have um, some case where the dark matter can interact with itself, then um, the picture is going to look different. So now I have my dark matter coming in, here's my interaction site again, that's my origin, but 
in the process, um, it exchanges some new particle phi. <coughs> so in the presence of these um, phi's that are being exchanged between the external legs, the incoming wave function is going to be different. Um, and so in this case, my incoming wave function, I'm going to model as just regular, um, regular psi. So this is probability psi naught at the origin squared. Um, and now my wave function is psi r without the little naught subscript. And the probability of finding this dark matter at the annihilation site is going to be psi at the origin squared. <clears throat> so the presence of this self-interaction changes the wave function, um, and so the probability of um, observing an interaction event here is going to be different than it is um, for this case here. Um, and we quantify these differences by uh, an enhancement factor, S, um, that is just the ratio of the wave function in this case uh, over the probability of the in the hard annihilation case. So the whole kind of trick here when you're trying to figure out exactly what your enhancement is, um, is to solve for the incoming wave function in the perturbed and unperturbed cases, take their ratio, um, and that gives you S. Um, now, this is a really hard thing to do if your system is relativistic, but because the dark matter particles are non-relativistic, you can actually just solve for psi by using the regular Schrodinger equation. Um, so that simplifies the calculation by quite a bit. Um, I'm not gonna work that out in detail, mainly because uh, it, it's a bit, I don't know, I don't think it would be terribly illustrative up on the blackboard. Um, but what I will do is kind of outline what happens for a very simple case. Um, so you get an idea for, uh, for what's, what implications this has for experiments. <clears throat> so I'm going to consider the case where there's some interacting potential um, that's just a Yukawa potential. Um, so this is what we'd expect to get for the case of a boson. That's a boson phi that's mediating between these different states. So in the case, so here's my Yukawa potential, um, and it's going to be um, attractive when alpha is less than zero and repulsive when alpha is greater than zero. <clears throat> um, so let's do a limiting case of uh, the Yukawa potential, which is um, the scenario where M phi is zero, so massless. So I've got the exchange of some massless boson. Um, and in this case, this is just the Coulomb potential. <clears throat> and uh, if you were to actually go through the whole exercise of setting up your Schrodinger equation with the Coulomb potential in it, solving for the wave functions, taking this ratio, it's all doable. I'm not going to do it up on the board myself. But you end up getting the following. So it's some function of alpha, the constant out in front, v, the relative velocity of the dark matter particles, um, and then just some factors of 2 pi. Um, but there's some interesting behavior you can read off from just looking at this. And the first is that um, regardless of whether or not the potential is attractive or repulsive, S goes to unity as the velocity, the relative velocity goes to infinity. Um, and so that makes sense intuitively because if these dark matter particles are moving so fast, 
they don't, they're not lingering around each other very much, so they hardly know um, that the other one is there, and so there's no enhancement um, from this process. Um, if um, I have a repulsive, oops, if I have a repulsive potential, then S goes to zero as the relative velocity goes to zero. That also makes sense. If there's a repulsive interaction, these two guys are going to be moving further apart, um, and uh, they won't actually end up annihilating in that limit. Question? Doesn't your assumption of the no relativistic particles then break down these principles? Oh, uh, sure, but um, uh, large. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in that limit, but not while they're still. So the yeah, it's still, yeah, you still see that general behavior. Um, <clears throat> in the case where it's uh, attractive, then the Sommerfeld enhancement goes to um, 2 pi, oops, 2 pi alpha over V. Um, uh, so this means that actually in the case where it's attractive, um, you actually see an enhancement. These two guys, are, these two dark matter particles are moving slowly enough that they feel the attractive force between them, and so that increases the probability that both of them will end up interacting at that site, um, and that overall increases the annihilation rate. Um, so what I've done here is to show you what happens in the case of the, this limit for the Coulomb potential. Um, you could just go through and do this whole exercise for the full Yukawa potential, you have to do it numerically. Um, and I'll just kind of sketch out what you end up getting in this case. So this is going to be as a function of dark matter mass, and this is the Sommerfeld enhancement. Um, so for our Yukawa potential, and I'm going to be a little sloppy by not labeling, well, I'll label some of the axes. So this is a TEV, let's we'll say that's 10 to the 4 GeV and 10 to the 5 GeV. So we're talking about very heavy dark matter. Um, so the Sommerfeld enhancement here, the first line I've drawn is the case where the relative velocity is 10 to the minus 1. Um, if I decrease the velocity um, for an attractive, we're only going to, I'm only going to sketch this out for an attractive. So I have an attractive Yukawa potential. If I decrease this velocity, should I expect that the Sommerfeld enhancement grows or gets smaller? Holler it. Smaller? Uh, oh, so you want me to draw the line below it? Uh, so, yeah, so, so as the um, velocity, it, it actually ends up following the behavior of the Coulomb potential. Um, so as the velocity gets smaller, the Sommerfeld enhancement actually goes up. Um, so it actually is somewhere up here. But thank you for shouting it out. That was good. Showed a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> um, so, okay, good. So this is as I'm decreasing the relative velocity. Um, now, if I continue decreasing further, um, then at some point I'm going to start actually getting some interesting behavior, which is not modeled by anything I've actually given you there. Uh, so this is 10 to the minus 3. And if I decrease the relative velocity even further, this becomes even more dramatic and looks something like this. And what's going on here is that I'm decreasing the velocity to such a point that the potential energy between the dark matter dominates over the kinetic energy, and I form bound states of the dark matter particles. So these resonances here are indicative of uh, the formation of dark matter bound states. And you can see that if you happen to be living, and they only occur at certain discrete values of dark matter masses. And so if your dark matter happens to be living close to one of these resonances, you actually expect to get a fairly, a very dramatically large enhancement in your annihilation signal from the formation of these bound, um, 
bound structures. Yeah? So for instance, you have the automatic really heavy. So you have bound things that are kind of relativistic, but you have them. Uh, oh, if you're forming a bound state and it's relativistic? Yeah. Oh, well, then this formalism is not going to is not going to work okay. for you there. Yeah, because this is, this is, I mean, all of this, this is just coming from solving non-relativistic. No, yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, if you have, like, a non-relativistic heavy particle, and then when you get from the bound state, so there are some elements that you have some room, like, you know, like, for constants that are really heavy, so they cannot form the non-relativistic. Oh, I see. I think I see what you're saying. So you're saying, like, if you're at some mass, like, all the way up here yeah, or some, yeah, yeah, this problem, then this will, this again will also break down, so you probably, you can't trust this as I've drawn it. Yeah. Uh, yeah? So earlier, uh, you made a comment that the average star is never constant, so it's just always going to be constant. Yeah. Is there a reason to think that we should be thinking about the kilometers per second rather than the units? Oh, mm. yeah, so before I was in kilometers per second, and this is in units of C. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's that was good. I should I was a little sloppy of my writing that. Yeah. The, the formula for the Coulomb case, is that valid for higher power calculators as well? For what? Higher power calculators. For higher partial waves. Um sorry, I, I don't understand what you're Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, good, yeah, this is assuming L equals zero. Yeah, no, so it'll be different if you go, but th th this is coming from the fact that for this scenario, you expect to be dominated by, by this. Yeah, so one could actually go through, and um, I'm not going to do this up on the board, but you can actually go through and write out this formalism um, generically is for, any, uh, for any L. Just, just one follow-up. Mm -hmm. Oh, not on the top of my head, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah? So C is not corresponding to the bound state S. Yeah. So we could also think of the equivalent of the first derivative of C that the four components are really just the S and the C. Oh, you mean the relative uh, distances between these? Yeah, the relative distances become smaller as you go to higher mass. So Oh, uh, yeah, but this is, again, this is making the assumption, this is for a given dark matter particle, so that would just be telling you that overall you'd have a, an enhancement regardless of what your dark matter, within the resolution of the experiment, regardless of whatever your dark matter mass is. Um, yep. What is the inversion by showing the certain masses from the bound state? Oh, um, so, yeah, so this is coming from, um, the, the, essentially, the potential energy dominates. When you write out your Schrodinger equation, the potential energy term um, starts dominating over your kinetic energy term. Um, and then it actually just ends up looking like a regular hydrogen type spectrum. It just reduces to that. Um, and uh, the, actually, it's really kind of fun, like if you do this out, um, I don't have time to do it here, but um, the ratios between the peaks is precisely, it's, it's uh, I think it's, one to four to nine. It's, ex it's exactly what you'd expect from doing the hydrogen case, which is fun. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, another question. Yeah. Uh, what regulates the bound state? Is it the bound What regulates? Like the regular particles going to the Oh, oh, right, right like here? Yeah. Um, mm -mm. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have the, a good answer for you right off the top of my head, but we, we can discuss that for, yep. The cross section is down to the bound side in this case, right? Ah, good, yes, that makes sense. So it should be the same for the typical bound state. There should be a what? Based on, well, this, you mean that this formula doesn't apply, this formula does not describe what's going on at the bound state. Yeah, yeah, this formula was just um, a simple case uh, for, um, for the Coulomb scenario, just to show you this scaling here. 
which ends up being the same scaling you see for the Yukawa case. But to get, to actually see the bound states, you have to, that's a separate, you, don't, you can't actually see that from the, the Coulomb case. Um, okay, so you guys ended up asking such good questions that I think I might have to skip over nuts and bolts. Uh, so <laughs> um, I will just jump into showing you what some of the current uh, experimental results look like, just so you have some idea of what's out there. Um, uh, the screen down, I don't, it's gonna. Uh, <laughs> <is> it? Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Oh, nuts and bolts, I was gonna describe a little bit about the kinds of um, backgrounds, astrophysical backgrounds that are relevant and also how you set up your likelihood for doing an actual analysis, which I'm happy to chat about afterwards if, if you have any questions. I just wanna make sure I finish close to, close to time. Uh, okay, so I wanted to make sure that I was able to show you what data actually looks like um, before I finished. Um, so this is one of my favorite pictures to show just because I remember when I first saw it just being like really struck by the kind, the amount of advancement that we've made over the last few decades. So the first picture at the top um, was the first map of the gamma ray sky from the 1960s uh, and that was from the OSO3 satellite um, looking at gamma rays with energies above 50 MeV. Um, and I, I think that must have been drawn by hand. Um, and so not shown are a bunch of other things that happened in the meantime, but then an egret in the 1990s uh, looked at gamma rays from 30 MeV to 30 GeV, and um, that was their all sky map. Um, and this is what we have to work with now, um, coming from the Fermi Large Area Telescope. So it's covering a much wider range of energies and you can see that the amount of structure you can actually make out on the sky is much more detailed. Um, so it's, it's really amazing to see just how far uh, we've come in this. Um, so this is just a blown up version of that Fermi sky map, labeling um, different uh, contributions, mainly coming from, uh, these are just kind of standard uh, sources. So the um, really, so the brighter the color here is the higher the density, the photon flux, gamma ray flux. Um, you see that there's this horizontal um, band there that's red and yellow, that's the galactic plane. Um, the cosmic ray emission that we see from there is really high because there's a lot of gas. Um, so that's why it's really bright. Um, there's also additional uh, gamma ray sources just kind of peppered around the sort of this image. So there's some like bright specks uh, those are resolved point sources. Those could be um, like really bright black holes from other galaxies or pulsars within our own galaxy. Um, it's a little harder to see, but um, maybe I could trace it out for you. So these were just discovered fairly recently, but there's these bubbles near the center part of the galaxy. You can kind of make them out because you see this kind of curved part here and then also this curved part down there. Um, and that we actually do not know precisely what's causing the Fermi bubbles. Um, it's very likely to be something like the black hole, um, the black hole at the center of our galaxy spit some stuff out, it got ejected out, it's extending very large distances, but we don't, um, you know, so that, that's probably what's happening, but that's actually something that's kind of an open question right now. Uh, yeah, and then some of these other spots on the sky, we expect to see like other galaxies, um, so dwarf galaxies or something like that. So I will just show you the dwarf galaxy analysis and then um, take any questions. So the dwarf galaxies are the ones that are currently providing the best bounds on um, annihilation signatures from dark matter. Um, there's about 50 or so known dwarfs so far. Um, that number doubled about a few years ago. So previously we knew about the blue um, dwarfs that are here. So those were um, known from um, Sloan. And then a few years ago, we have um, a list of new candidates. Those are shown in red. That's coming from the Dark Energy Survey. So that nearly doubled the number of targets that we have to look at. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned earlier, dwarf galaxies are really great places to look for dark matter annihilation because they're dark matter dominated systems. There's very few stars in them and very little gas. So um, you pretty much just take 
uh, you, know, you know what location on the sky you expect to see your dwarf, you look at where that patch is in the Fermi data, and you look to see how many photons are there, and whether or not it's consistent with there being some additional annihilation from dark matter. Um, and so this is an analysis done by the Fermi collaboration uh, that essentially does precisely that. So using um, 45 of these dwarf galaxies, um, they don't see uh, any um, obvious signals. And so the way this is usually plotted is on the horizontal axis is the dark matter mass. On the vertical axis is the annihilation cross-section, so sigma v. The dashed line here is just to guide the eye. It's the cross-section you'd expect if the dark matter was um, a thermal relic in the simplest uh, models, so that's around 3 times 10 to the minus 26. Um, this uh, plot here is assuming that the dark matter annihilates to bees, so then the bees shower into pions, the pions give you the photons. Um, and everything above the line is excluded. Um, so their current bound is given by uh, the black here, this black line. Um, and the band, sometimes is referred to as like a Brazil plot because of the colors, but the band here is um, indicating the expected uh, 68 and 95 percent containment around the expected value, which is the dashed uh, black that's there. Um, and so you can see that this black line here, their actual limit, crosses below the thermal relic cross-section at roughly 50 or so GeV. So nominally how you would interpret that is that um, the current indirect detection signals are starting to probe um, thermal relic dark matter, which I think Neil um, introduced last week, um, roughly below uh, these masses here. Uh, and um, what's labeled here, these little specks, are anomalies from uh, the center of our galaxy, um, which are uh, in tension with the current bounds from these dwarf analyses. Um, now, people expect that the number of dwarf galaxies is going to increase um, beyond just the 50 or so that have been observed so far. So every time that we find a new dwarf galaxy, it essentially gives us a potentially new target to look for dark matter annihilation. Um, and really what we need is just one really good one that happens to be in a really clean region of the sky and that's not too far away. Um, and that, you know, could give amazing sensitivity to a potential signal. So that's something that I think is going to be um, a fruitful area of study in the, in the coming years with a lot of the new um, uh, uh, missions that we'll be launching um, in the future. Um, so there's a variety of other, um, I mean, there's many other ways um, where studies that have been done looking for uh, dark matter annihilation, so using other targets, extragalactic sources, looking at our own Milky Way. Um, I don't have time to go through that today, but I'm happy to chat about it afterwards or if there's any questions. But I wanted to make sure to at least show you this one because this is the most sensitive um, set of constraints that we have uh, to date. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take any, any remaining questions, yeah? Yeah, that's important. Yeah, the way these plots are usually made is assuming that it's 100% annihilation to the particular channel that they happen to have labeled. So this would change, um, well, first of all, it changes a lot depending on the annihilation channel, and then it would also change if it's only some fraction going to one channel versus another. Is it a cross-section? Uh, no, it's a branching fraction. Uh, it's a cross-section, but you're, you're assuming that 100% um, of the time, the dark matter is going into B quarks. Um, so for example, if, only, if the dark matter went to B quarks only 10% of the time, then you'd expect that the signal you'd be getting from that would be correspondingly weaker. Uh, yeah, but that's, so that's making the assumption that all of the photons that you see are coming from BB bar. Yeah, yeah, so if it was only some small fraction, then um, your, your limit on the cross-section would be correspondingly weaker. Um, yeah? Oh, yeah, so this is because, um, uh, you need enough energy to actually produce the B quarks. Um, but if you looked at different annihilation channels, so let's say going to electrons or muons, um, you can actually go to lower masses because the Fermi data um, extends down to like 200, 300 MeV. So the, you do have data that goes down to much lower energies. 
caveat is um, the quality of the data gets, um, is not, it's, it's harder to work with just because the point spread function starts getting really large when you go down to those low energies and so it just becomes, it, it becomes correspondingly harder to do an analysis. Oh, mm, yeah, so it's, it's actually the, this is actually coming from the fact that there's an excess down here. So uh, there's a couple of these new dwarf candidates where they see small excesses, like two sigma, one sigma type excesses, um, roughly in a region that would be somewhat consistent with like 10 GV-ish, which is why you see that the, the observed limit gets weaker there. Um, the actual significance of any one of these systems isn't very large, though, so it's not enough to be able to claim a detection. Yeah? Oh, um, no, no, if you go to their paper, they have all, all the annihilation channels. I'm just showing you the one for B quarks as an example. It, it tends to be kind of like the benchmark one that people always work with, but um, yeah, they have like Ws and Zs and electrons, muons, and taus. Higgs portal or a Z portal? Uh, so y you're imagining like the dark matter annihilating to bees through a Higgs or something like that? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter actually what the, I mean, yeah, it doesn't, uh, the couplings that would be allowed would change, right? Because then that would, this is a function of what those couplings are, so the allowed couplings would vary, but um, this is essentially independent to whatever is going on in the blob. Oh, um, it, I mean, it constrains certain regions of the parameter space. Yeah. Why this scale does not go as m squared? Oh, you mean like the direct detection plots? No, I imagine that. That it doesn't scale as. I guess I'm still a little bit confused about what the question is. Maybe, is, is your question, I mean, this band here, this is coming from like the data sensitivity. Right. Yeah. I think you were just asking, you were saying that the uh, annihilation process is scale of like the number density squared of the scale of the number mm -hmm. density squared. And you were just wondering why that line doesn't go to scale of the number density squared. But the Higgs jet portal in the sensitivity uh, experiment is still not there. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are kind of feeding into that sensitivity bound, so it's a little bit harder to kind of disentangle the simple relationship. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, well, good. So if there's no other questions, um, I'll conclude there. Um, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the week in Princeton, and feel free to, uh, if you have any other lingering questions, I'm happy to chat afterwards, or um, you know, feel free to send me an email or something like that. All right, thanks. Thank you.